It's Tuesday, August 20th. I'm Matt Harmon. Welcome to the Yahoo Fantasy Forecast. It is a hell of a day to talk ball. And join me to do just that is, I guess we have to call you Yahoo Fantasy's uh, resident hater, Dan Titus. Uh, appreciate you being here, buddy. What's going on? What's up, Matt? Happy to be the resident hater. Somebody's got to do it. So let's get to it, man. I'm ready to talk about some bus pause. But, you know, these guys may not be actual bus. It's just we're talking relative to the, the round we're drafting them. So this episode is it's titled bus. I'm sure that's how they're going to sell it on social. I'm sure that's how they're going to put it in the title so that people actually click on it. Uh, what we're really going to do is, is is a little bit relative. Like, I don't love the term, oh, this guy's a bus. He's going he's gonna to take your season, whatever. But these are guys we are drafting around. But before we get into that, I do just have to let you know that the fantasy mailbag is open for business the rest of August at the end of every single show. Which again, I, I do think that sounds more like a threat than uh, a promise or or a, a feature. We're going to be answering the pressing questions that you have heading into your most important drafts. You can tweet at me. Uh, I'll try to tweet out some call to actions as well. But I've already gotten plenty of people just just straight up tweeting at me. Appreciate that at Matt Harmon underscore byb. You also get bumped to the front of the line if you submit your questions via voice memo or video to Fantasy Mailbag at yahoosports.com. We're going to try to just get to as many good questions as possible. Every single show here in August. Before we jump into uh, our haterade pod here, Dan Titus, we have one little bit of news uh, to cover from over the weekend. And frankly, um, this this might actually bring out maybe the hater uh, in me. Gardner Minshew has won the starting job at quarterback for the Las Vegas Raiders. Antonio Pierce announced that over the weekend. Uh, Dan, before I give my two cents on this, you tell me what was your reaction to Minchu being the guy over Aiden O'Connell uh, and just kind of how this sets your expectations for the Raiders offense. I think it's just the Raiders just doing what they can do to muster that to have some kind of floor for this fan base here because Aiden O'Connell, yeah, he was okay last year with 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 uh, when Pierce was under the helm and this became a run first team. So I wasn't really excited on the pass catchers anyway, but at least we saw Michael Pittman be a pretty good fantasy receiver last mm-hmm. year with Garner Minshew at quarterback. So I'm hoping, praying that that uh, resonates with Devontae Adams because we saw how visibly frustrated he was with the Jimmy Garoppolo experience for much of the last season. So I think it actually is a good thing for Devontae and the pass catchers. We'll just see how long it lasts. Like if they don't get any wins, I think that this is going to be a pretty short lease for Garner Minshew. And I don't know, probably fantasy managers as well. Their hopes are going to go down as much because this is too much volatility at quarterback and the Raiders. And the Raiders are a weird team um, because there are parts of this roster that I do want to get really excited about. You know, I, I, to be honest with you, Dan, Devontae Adams, Jacoby Myers, Brock Bowers, and and some of the supporting characters here on offense with the line that I think is probably closer to average than the bottom of the league. Maybe even they could probably push slightly below above, above average, yeah. in my opinion. That all together, I would be excited about that with almost any other quarterback situation than Gardner Minshew versus Aiden O'Connell. I, I just think, you know, and I said this at the time when they signed Minshew and just said, oh, yeah, he's going to c- compete with O'Connell for the starting job. I was like, this has to have the least juice I've ever seen out of a quarterback battle because it is, <laughs> isn't as even if one of these guys is a a, a former first round pick that, like, oh, he's a Baker yeah. Mayfield. Let's, is this a reclamation project? You know, obviously. J.J. McCarthy's out for the season now at this point, but, you know, Sam Darnold versus J.J. McCarthy. This is a a former high-pedigree guy and a a rookie first-round pick. This guy that was a day-three draft pick in Aiden O'Connell, who you said played fine last year, I think I'd agree with that. I think he showed a lot um, to to maybe be excited about, but nothing like, oh, this is the future of the franchise. And Gardner Minshew is a, I think, good backup quarterback that you want to get you through a stretch, but not a guy that's even in the, Fitzpatrick tier of oh we could we could put together an exciting offense with Gardner Mitchell. I mean the guy's got exciting facial hair and he's got exciting hair, but I wouldn't say that his game uh, is an is an exciting product to watch. So that all together was already just kind of like okay, I don't really know how to feel about that. And to me, look and obviously I think the way they pitched this quarterback battle was these two guys are going to compete in camp and who's ever better in camp is going to be the week one starter. And I think so far from everything we've heard, Gardner has been better than O'Connell in camp. I just thought if it was me, I'd want to see what O'Connell has in the first four weeks. And like, if he's 
If he, he if you're losing games, you start out, you know, one and three or something. Yeah, then you go with Minshew because you know what that is. So uh, I I think we will see Aiden O'Connell at some point. And yeah, I know we're going to talk about players we're avoiding. Uh, I have at least one Raiders player uh, when we get to this exercise. But yeah, just generally, Dan, I don't want to invest into in fantasy in an offense that I already feel at some point will be starting two quarterbacks, no doubt about it. Yeah, you're you're pretty much banking on the battle of backups here. So, like, while I think Devontae Adams should be okay, it's the other pass catchers that I'm a little bit more concerned about. Um, it's pretty much a mid-off, so you're right. Like, it's not exciting. The Raiders should have definitely been in the market for a better marquee quarterback, tried to trade for someone. Um, I don't think we're going to see Garner Mitchell all season, but to your point, this is just the lesser of two evils here. It's like, hey, let's throw out a guy that we know – can somewhat play competently, and if he doesn't work out, then we'll turn to the other guy. So we'll see how it does, but I'm not targeting any Raiders very highly in my draft boards. Yeah, not to mention, too, what Minshew did last season from – and it wasn't it wasn't good. Like it wasn't it wasn't above average play behind center for the Colts. A lot of it was RPO based. It was get the ball mm-hmm. out quick on in breaking routes to Michael Pittman uh, as the first read guy. That's not really. Uh, I don't think that's what we'll see under Luke Getzey in this offense because that it's hard to t- it's hard to tell because they played with Justin Fields. Justin Fields, who's a specific type of quarterback in Chicago right. and a very different type of quarterback than Gardner Minshew. So we don't quite know what philosophically gets he's bringing to the table uh but yeah Devonte adams as the seventh pick in the second round uh by consensus four for four adp that is someone i definitely considered with i don't know if i love uh investing into Devonte adams at, at that adp especially when there's so many other talented receivers around him so um and, and again he's probably the most comfortable click i have in this raiders offense right now um not great we'll see uh the raiders first four games at chargers at baltimore Versus Panthers at home, uh, home against Cleveland. Those are that's you know obviously the Panthers are in the mix here, but Ugh. otherwise that that could be a potentially tough schedule. So we shall see what uh, year two, the first full season of the Antonio Pierce experience brings us. But let's waste no more time, and let's keep on the hater train here, Dan Titus, because we're starting off Convictions Week on the pod. You know, it's a little a little bit of negativity. I don't love to be negative. I'm generally a positive guy when covering the sport of football, but. It is positive. It's a positive experience to give the listeners some players to avoid. And like I said, I don't. We don't want to call these players busts, Dan Titus, but these are guys that we are drafting around, basically. So we did this exact same exercise, me and you, last year, which is why I'm, I'm calling you the resident hater here. Every single year, we're like, let's get Dan <laughs> Titus off uh, enough fantasy basketball. Let's get him on here <laughs> to talk some trash about guys who are ten times, a hundred times more athletic than us. And that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna go through uh, b- from consensus ADP. From 4 for 4, our friends over there, they have a great tool. Uh, you can just search 4 for 4 Consensus ADP to find this. Uh, we're just going to go with our least favorite pick in every single round. We're going to try to get the early rounds and the mid rounds here. Let's start with the first round, Dan Titus. Uh, and we both have the same guy here. And I will say we're both kind of cheating because <laughs> due to injuries to guys like Jameer Gibbs and Puka Nakua, Saquon Barkley's been pushed up into the first round in consensus ADP, the 12th overall player. So the very last pick of the first round in 12-team leagues. But that's the guy that we are out on. Uh, he was also the guy you had in your as your least favorite first-round pick last year, and it kind of worked out for you, buddy. Yeah, it did. And I think we can follow a similar trend here. Uh, the thing about Saquon Barkley is that he had a monster year in 2022, and he's coming off a lot of touches that year. He had almost 400 touches. And so it wasn't a surprise to see him get hurt last year. Now, sure, everyone can say that Saquon Barkley is going to have the best offensive line of his career. No doubt. No question there. But he's also playing with a running quarterback that happens to be the best running and efficient quarterback in the red zone in Jalen Hurts. I mean, this guy ran 53% of the time inside the five, which is more than Christian McCaffrey. So if you're talking about TD equity, Saquon Barkley moving to the Eagles, that's not really the best move that you want to see out of a first round pick. But then also the targets. Jalen Hurts has not really been a guy that's been throwing to the running backs. And Kellen Moore is there as the offensive coordinator now. So we might see a little bit of an uptick there, but it's still not going to be enough to justify the Saquon Barkley that we saw of old that really had a lot of his success because he was such a good pass catcher. If he runs between the tackles, he's still going to have a little bit of competition with Kenny Gainwell. I'm out on Saquon as the 12th pick in the first round. That's not to say he's not going to have a good year, 
But I'm just saying, it might be a little bit too high relative to the other guys that are going around him. Yeah, I think he's more of like a mid-second round pick. So again, he has been boosted up because of some of these injuries, whether it's uh, Gibbs and, and Puka. These are probably the two main guys who would be first round picks uh, if it wasn't mm-hmm. for Saquon, if it wasn't for those injuries. So that's how Saquon gets up there. I'm with you. I have most of the same concerns here. Um, I don't think they will be p- push and tush uh, as much as they were in Philadelphia last year now that Jason Kelsey's retired, but they're not going to completely take goal line rushing work away from Jalen Hurts. He's had, uh, he's had an absurd amount of just overall touchdowns the last two years combined, passing and rushing, so I don't think that's completely going off of his plate. With Barkley, too, we also have to be a little bit concerned about the fact that his rushing success rate, his yards per carry, his explosive rushing rate all dropped last year. And look, the Giants were a train wreck. These This Eagles offense, you know, they're working in a new system, but it's certainly going to be better than whatever the hell was going on in New York last year. There's no doubt about that. We know that running back play can be very influenced by offensive environment, of course. But still, you know, we have to ask about just where Barkley is at this point from a talent perspective. I, I like the the move to bring him in and like kind of try to take that rushing ecosystem to the next level. It's always been productive with guys like Miles Sanders and DeAndre Swift, but I wouldn't say that it was a run game, just a pure running back run game that people have necessarily been terrified of the last couple of years. So I think Barkley can be a good player for the Eagles. I think he can be actually a pretty decent fantasy pick, but just when I look at the first round last year, Dan, and this is kind of my final point on this, there's not a lot of offensive first round picks this year in, in my mind. I think all these receivers that go are justified here. I think all and maybe Garrett Wilson, obviously we're, we're doing some stretching there, but uh, the first nine picks, McCaffrey, Lamb, Hill, Brees Hall, Jamar Chase, B. John Robinson, Amon Ross St. Brown, Justin Jefferson, A.J. Brown, all those guys are fine. And then in this back half, I look at Jonathan Taylor, look at Garrett Wilson, Saquon Barkley. Barkley's just my least favorite pick there. Yeah, that's where I'm at with it. It's not that I'm completely out on Barkley. It's just that when I'm looking at names like Garrett Wilson, Assuming Aaron Rodgers is healthy, I'd much rather have him and and taking a pass catcher that can, you know, uh, just raise the ceiling a little bit. Whereas, like, I think we already know what Saquon Barkley is. His best season was his rookie year. Are we still chasing that? Like, where is – I just don't see where we're going to be able to recoup the value. Like, I think we're still going off name notoriety alone here. And uh, as you said, I think it's really the injuries to Puka Nakua and Jamar Gibbs uh, – Jameer Gibbs, excuse me, that uh, really kind of pushed him up. And I think fantasy manager will be happy with Saquon Barkley, but he's got to stay upright. And that's not something that he's been able to do in his career. So even if you got the Eagles beast offensive line, you still got so many other variables at stake here that it's going to be hard to justify him taking him in the first round. All right, let's go to round two, uh, where it gets a little bit more interesting here. There were a couple of players I considered, but uh, the guy that you picked Man, um, I want you to well, I want you to take this because I, I love this player, but you know, I've already kind of expressed some concerns about the fantasy outlook here for Chris Olave. So tell me why you're out on Chris Olave as the uh the the uh, in, as a second round pick. I had a couple guys here too, and I, I hated to do it because I loved Chris Olave last year. Um, I just love what he does from a route running perspective, just the talent alone. But this isn't a bet against Chris Olave. This is a bet against Derek Carr. Mm. Derek Carr is abysmal. He's the check down (laughs) machine. Like how many times, like the creativity of this offense, like it's great that they brought in Clint Kubiak first and foremost, like those, they should be running more motion. Hopefully they'll run more design plays to get the ball into their playmakers hands. But I just can't trust Derek Carr. He never gets through his progressions. This offensive line is bottom 10 this year. And it's only getting worse. Like he showed out, he played pretty well in his preseason game, but like, Derek, the real Derek Carr will emerge here, and you're just going to have Chris Olave running go routes, you know, g- accumulating those those air yards that he always does. Mm. I just don't have a lot of faith in the quarterback because I think that that's going to suppress what Chris Olave really could be. And hopefully they do scheme for him more. I think he's still going to be a really good wide receiver. It's just in the second round when you're paying that draft capital, it, it's just tar- it's just hard to to wrap your arms around Derek Carr is throwing you the ball and he's expected to be the wide receiver one as a result of that. It's just, I can't get there. It's, it's a well-taken point, man, because I've been excited about Clint Kubiak and some of the things that he should, should bring to this offense from a play action standpoint, from a pre-snap motion, a full speed motion at the snap standpoint. I, I think just moving this offense into the modern era is good, right? I think people don't realize that 
the Saints have not had new ideas on offense in 20 years. Like, because Pete Carmichael was with the original Sean Payton staff that got there in 2006. That it's a big deal, Kubiak coming in here and potentially changing things up. But it's still Derek Carr, right? Like, and and Chris Olave, where he where I have him ranked this year, and I have him as wide receiver 16, which is a few spots below his wide receiver 11 uh, ADP. I have him more as like a third round pick than a second round pick. So I, yeah. I'm kind of with you on this. But that is still a progression. Like, that that's the thing here. Me saying he's going to be wide receiver 15, 16 is still a jump from what we saw last year. But we're jumping several spots to get him up here to a wide receiver one. And I also think, look, I'm a big Chris Olave fan, but I've said this, I've said this a lot this offseason that I'm trying to be harsher on wide receivers from, like, a where they rank stand, in the league standpoint. And I think Olave has shown to be a good wide receiver one but maybe not like a superstar wide receiver one just yet. I, I think he could put together the skills that he needs to get there from an individual standpoint, but I think he has to be better in you know tight coverage situations. I think he has to be better from a physical play standpoint, which you know we just that that has not necessarily been part of his game in the NFL, and even in, in college that wasn't really how he profiled as a prospect. So I think there are some very very minor nitpicky criticism with, with Chris Olave, and then there's still just a a quarterback like situation here where, like I said, Chris Olave could be better than he was last year. Derek Carr could be better than he was last year. And Chris Olave could still not meet wide receiver one, you know, levels here. I, just one final point I will, I will say about the, the whole Chris Olave thing too. If he comes out and like I chart the routes from week one and he's running, you know, like 20% slant routes or something like that, Throw out everything that I just said, okay? Because then I think we're going to kind of be in business. A lot of this is kind of yeah. a route tree question. His first two years, Chris Olave ran a slant route in reception perception on 7.4% of his sample routes as a rookie, which Dan Titus, that is the lowest for any player that I've charted since 2014. And it Jeez. jumped up to 13.4% last year, which is still well below the league average. So, again, I, I think he... I think he can get there. I think the situation could be a little better, but it is rich saying he could be a second-round player in fantasy this season. I'm with you there. And and to your point about the physicality, yeah, his contested catch rate ranks 75th among qualifiers. Um, the target separation, you know, dominator rating, like all these areas where he could definitely improve. And I just don't know that he's been put in a position to showcase that because he hasn't been able to get the ball because it's always going to Alvin Kamara. So we'll see how this kind of transcends. And I think it's a, definitely a good in the right step getting Clint Kubiak in there. Hopefully we get a little bit more of a modern system that can get him the ball more frequently, but at cost right now, I, I'm with you. I think it's more of a third round pick than a second. All right. My guy uh, is, I, I don't think he's offensively ranked as a second round pick, but Travis Etienne to me, I think is more of an, another guy. that's more of a third rounder than a second rounder running back nine and consensus ADP uh, the seventh pick of the second round. Right now, he's going ahead of guys like Isaiah Pacheco and Devon Achan, who just straight up I'd rather have. If we're picking second-round running backs, I'd rather have <laughs> both of those guys in Travis Etienne. He is the last player in what I think is Tier 2 at the running back position this year, but if he falls closer to guys like Rashad White, Josh Jacobs, James Cook, who I have in my third tier, that would not be surprising to me. Um, overall, I have concerns about how the run game was constructed Last year in Jacksonville, I have offensive line concerns in Jacksonville. Like, you know, adding Mitch Morris is nice as, at center, but at this point in, in Mitch's career, how much is he a needle mover at that position? There are questions on the interior overall. And look, you know, I think we should have questions about where this offense is from a design standpoint, from a play calling standpoint. You know, they've been debating as to who's going to be the play caller for a big bulk of the offseason. And if it ends up back in Press Taylor's hands, you know, like 90% of it, that would be a pretty critical concern because I don't, I, I spent made way too much time focusing on the passing game in Jacksonville last year with the whole Calvin Ridley stuff and, and the volatility there and his usage. And frankly, like, I think the passing game might have been better designed than the run game. So he has definitely been a guy that I haven't really clicked on very much because of all of those concerns combined. Yeah, my thing about ETN is that, or at least that, that I still find myself pressing uh, the draft button on him, is that it's just the opportunity share. Yeah, I don't think he has much competition in terms of the running back room. He was very well involved in the passing game. So even if the running game and the offensive line isn't as good, at least we know he can still produce something of, of relevancy and value like some running backs can't do, like Derrick Henry. Um, and so 
around there, I agree that he's probably a tier three guy, but I would still be okay with drafting him relative to the other running backs uh, that are going around him, like Derrick Henry. I would much rather have uh, Travis Etienne there. Um, and Devon Achan, I'm, I'm okay with that too. Like that's the the high upside pick. This guy gives me Chris Johnson vibes. So mm-hmm. if you're looking for a guy that's getting into a system that's like a track meet, when he every time he touches the ball, it's electric. That's what I'm going for. When Travis Etienne gets the ball, it's very seldom electric. Um, so yeah, I I agree with you. Where there's some other guys that I would take ahead of him, but I'm still okay with taking him. Yeah, like I said, not an offensive second round pick, but just the guy that when you talk about all those running backs that you threw out there, you know, Kyron Williams, Derrick Henry included, he is he's my last ranked guy. So I just don't end up with him very much when he does go in the second round. I'll go to the third round here and I'll get us started because. <sighs> This one kind of breaks my heart, man. Um, I, love the long sigh. <laughs> I, you know, I don't love that we're talking. We're talking down so far on Chris Olave, a player that I've been a longtime fan of, and a guy that I've really gone to bat for is Michael Pittman over the years. Um, you know, and and he was my one of my favorite picks last year when he was a freaking like seventh rounder, Dan, because I just thought he was way too good of a player to fall that far this year. He's going off the board. Uh, it's pretty late third round pick. He's the wide receiver 19. I have him closer to like wide receiver 23, more of like a true wide receiver, like low end wide receiver two for a variety of different reasons. None of which has to do with how good Michael Pittman is at football. I think Michael Pittman's, you know, a true number one receiver. Maybe he's not in that superstar group, but I think you can run a really good NFL offense with him as your number one receiver. However, I do think we should have volume questions here. You know, how often is this team going to really be pushing the ball? I I think it's not going to be nearly as drastic as some people thought last year when Anthony Richardson was a rookie. I think we're going to get some pretty decent passing volume here in Indianapolis because, you know, Richardson showed even in very glimpse, very small glimpses last year that he can process well, that he can handle kind of a big plate from a passing standpoint. You know, that being said, he's still a guy that's going to take off running. There's going to be, they're going to really emphasize Richardson and Jonathan Taylor working in conjunction of each other. Those guys were almost never on the field together last year. I think that's something this staff is really excited about. And it is also tough for me to square Dan the fact that I'm a big Michael Pittman fan, but you know Josh Downs is one of my guys. I think Anthony Richardson uh, and and Ad Mitchell are going to form a, a strong connection here at some point during the year. I've heard really great things about how this staff views Ad Mitchell uh, and and that he's not just like a pure X receiver that can run vertical routes on the boundary I think they want to move him around a little bit they've even experimented with him in the slot receiver position when Josh Downs has been hurt so are we going to see another 130 plus target season out of Michael Pittman or is he going to be kind of somewhere in that 120 ish area which I think would you know with his skill set make him a little bit of a, a letdown at ADP here so obviously it was a small sample size with Anthony Richardson last year but When the first couple of games where he got like 11 and a half targets, do you think that that was, was that like a script dependent? Was that, because I I do agree. I think Josh Downs showed a lot of rapport in just like not only the preseason, but like I think just in through camp and and through last year. And Anthony Richardson was actually surprisingly good as a a deep ball passer um, in the, the limited time that we, that we got to see him. But, you know, I feel like Pittman could be still be pretty good. I just the grade, I get it. Um, but I think he did at least show that he could command those targets as an alpha in this offense. But I'm always a little bit hesitant with a a run first quarterback that Stain Steichen uh Steichen offense, like we saw what, what he did with Jalen Hurts, took a little bit of time to integrate the, the alpha there, but AJ Brown worked out pretty damn well uh once he got his footing. So yeah, I, I I'm I'm kind of torn on on Michael Pittman. I don't know that I believe that. He's going to be the target monster. I think it's going to be more of a shared by committee kind of uh, offense where he'll just, you know, there'll be some RPO. There'll be, you know, some broken plays that he'll make plays out of, some dynamic plays. Uh, whereas maybe Pittman's skill set is better or more well suited for traditional offense that doesn't have so much of a dependency on a running quarter, quarterback. So yeah, that's where I'm kind of at. I just don't know like what to believe because we didn't see enough with Anthony Richardson last year. Right, like the two games where Richardson played the most was week one where he had 11 targets, Michael Pittman. It was worth noting that he only had one one target in the first half. Um, but look, they don't 
the, they count all four quarters. Okay, so uh, it's it's not a <laughs> it's not the worst thing in the world. But uh, that week four game against the Rams, a close loss. Uh, he only had five targets, and one catch. Like I think those games are going to be more within the range right. of outcomes here this year. And again, it, it doesn't have as much for me to do with Michael Pittman as a player, or even really Anthony Richardson as a player. It's just the fact that I think. Downs is a quality receiver who's going to kind of win in the same area where Michael Pittman gets a lot of those layup targets. And I really just think that A.D. Mitchell is going to have a huge role in this offense this year. I know he's been like competing with uh, Alec Pierce for snaps, I, I, you know, in camp. At some point, he's yeah. going to play a really, really big role uh, far ahead of uh, Alec Pierce. So I, I just think that that is the biggest hang up for me. We're splitting what could be a smallish pie between three guys that. <laughs> I really like his players. So uh, that's kind of where I am here. Your guy here, uh, Josh Jacobs, is a third-round pick. I'm interested to hear where you come down on Jacobs because I've been sort of kind of all over the place on him as a a fantasy pick this year. Yeah, I mean, for me, it's this kind of goes back to my Saquon argument from last year. It's like when the guys get the 400 touches, it seems to just go downhill after that. And monster year for Josh Jacobs in 2022. Led the league in rushing, five yards per carry. Um, but that aggressive downhill style pays, pays its dues. And I think last year we saw the, the ramifications of that, uh, his yards per carry dropped to three and a half. He was 37th in missed tackles per attempt. Um, at this point, like he got paid handsomely. So I feel like he's going to be the number one guy, but like history tells us this is a two back system. So whether it's Marshawn Lloyd, whether it's AJ Dillon, who got re-signed, I don't know that we're going to see a three down workhorse back that we saw when he was with the Raiders and frankly what he looked like last year looked like a guy that lost a step so you're paying a third round grade for that I think I'm out on that yeah Jacobs again is a guy that I think is he's okay as a third round pick not someone that I'm super excited to draft but you know he's he's running back 12 and a consensus ADP I have him as running back 13 I I've just generally been a little more mixed I don't have a strong take one way or the other but I think the the trap door here that you can fall through with Jacobs is just if he's not as good uh, as he was in that magic 2022 season, which as you mentioned, much like we said with Barkley, that has to be a concern that from a rushing perspective, he, he took a pretty significant step back last year. That being said, this is an offense I really want to invest into. I really want to invest into the green Bay Packers offense. And if he is the clear cut lead back, which, you know, Marshawn Lloyd being banged up and kind of behind in the off season, I think is a favor is, is, is a, point in favor of Josh Jacobs. I think AJ Dillon having a, you know, solid hold on the running back two job is a point in favor of Josh Jacobs just cuz I don't think Dillon <laughs> is a huge uh guy that's going to command a huge work share right now at this point. So, I'm a little more mixed. I think we're we're both a little more mixed on our on each other's third round pick as opposed to completely <laughs> out. So, I think that makes for uh, a good discussion if if the listener likes uh either Michael Pittman or Josh Jacobs. Let's take a quick break. When we come back, we'll get into some of these mid-round players we are avoiding this year in fantasy. All right, we're back. Round four consensus ADP player that you are avoiding, Dan Titus, is Twitter's favorite wide receiver, Malik Neighbors. Uh, tell me why you're <laughs> tell me why you are not drafting Malik Neighbors this year. Uh, and do it without saying the words Daniel Jones. Can't do yeah. it. Can't do it. <laughs> you, you get the theme of my uh, of my bust uh, campaign here, and it's all quarterback centric for the most part. And I'm so glad that you called it out on that. That I'm seeing all this Malik Neighbors X on, on my my X feed. It's just crazy. Like this is the best wide receiver that I can ever re- imagine. But like I'll give him credit. Like he looks great in the preseason. The problem is, is Daniel Jones. Like he looks terrible. Doesn't look good He's- in the preseason. <laughs> <laughs> He looks awful. Like, he's so mid. Like, I can't – I don't understand. Like, I I understand why Twitter is excited about it. They love the young, new, shiny toy of Malik Neighbors. But, like, when was the last time the Giants offense supported a 1,000-yard receiver? Do you remember? What year was it? Probably Odell Beckham, like, one of those seasons. Yeah, it was, like, 2018. (laughs) So, you mean to tell me six years ago they had a, a good wide receiver? I'm sorry. Until you get a real quarterback in that in that QB room, I'm out on every Giants wide receiver. And like, especially in the fifth, uh, was it the fourth round? That's crazy. Like, I, I even if he gets a Garrett Wilson like target share, he still has a Zach Wilson throwing to him or Trevor Simeon or whoever else you want to throw in there. Like, 
the touchdown equity just isn't going to be there. So like I'm there's going to be so many of those days where you're going to have those four for 37, five for 38, like, and then you'll have like the boom game. But like for the most part, come on, guys, you can do better than that. Uh, I think it's a little bit too early on neighbors, mainly because he's attached to Daniel Jones. Look, man, um, I thought one of the best, you know, as like you said, people are popping off about Malik Neighbors. Every fantasy analyst has probably told you by now that he was targeted on 30% of the routes he ran uh, in the most recent Giants preseason game. You know, he had a couple of great catches. Those are going to happen. He's going to get a ton of targets. There are going to be great catches. I thought this note from Josh Norris uh, when talking about, like, as, as Daniel Jones has thrown his second interception of the day against the Houston Texans in preseason. <laughs> second interception in preseason. Uh, you know, he just said, look, I love Malik Neighbors, but this is a concern uh, and the motive that Josh has behind, quote, draft good players on good teams. Josh said, I had to scroll down to the wide receiver 29 in points per game last season to find the first wide receiver who played in an offense that was bottom seven in touchdowns scored. Do you think the Giants are going to not be in the bottom seven in touchdowns scored with Daniel Jones at quarterback? Yeah, like 100%. And, and look, like, I have Malik Neighbors ranked a little bit ahead of his ADP right now, which is wide receiver 24. Um, be, because I'm a little bit more of, look, he's going to have these big weeks. And it's we do have to account for the upside of of him as a, a player overall. And I do think, Dan, the thing that gets me not completely out on neighbors is just that I think the floor will be pretty high based on how he's going to be used. I think they're going to get him so many design touches, but there's just going to be an enormous amount of meat on the bone uh, left this year. So I think neighbors can be a boom bust wide receiver too. But if you go into the fourth round and you don't want to, you want to click on one of these Texans wide receivers ahead of Malik neighbors. I think that's totally fine. You want to click on shoot DJ Moore in a crowded, uh, in a crowded wide receiver room that with a quarterback who looks great, you want to take, um, you know, I, I don't know, like even a Zay. I'm not. I don't have Zay Flowers ranked ahead of Malik Neighbors, but if you want to take him, you know, he's attached to the reigning MVP at quarterback. I, I think that's fine too. So I kind of can see either argument with Malik Neighbors. Uh, I do have him ranked a little bit ahead of ADP, but I mean, look, like the fact that Daniel Jones is the quarterback here, that is just going to put such a hard ceiling on where he can fly this year. Yeah, and and I think you said it best. Like I feel like it's at this point, it's not the talent and what neighbors can do. I trust Brian Dable will scheme up something to get the ball in his hands. I just can't ignore the fact that Daniel Jones has not supported a wide receiver one or even a wide receiver two in his, in his reign at quarterback there. Um, I think Kenny Galladay had the most, or maybe even Darius Slayton, the, the most he's ever had is like 750 yards. Like that can't, no, in the fifth round, no, 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 no. Or fourth round, excuse me. No, that's not, that's not going to happen. So I believe in the talent, don't believe in the quarterback at the helm. Good luck to you if you want to draft him, but I agree with the people that are going around, the players that are going around him, I would much rather prefer buying into a Texan offense, buying into a Chicago ascending offense, don't buy into the bottom feeding Giants who are going to be arguably one of the worst teams in the NFL. Yeah, like any amount of, man, look at the sick Malik neighbors catcher. Man, look at how many targets per route run he got. Those are things we should have already assumed. That moves me 0%. Like, show me Daniel Jones playing <laughs> quarterback well over like a four or five game stretch, which you're just not going to see until the regular season. So uh, maybe we, I, like I said, I I've, I can take a little bit of Malik Neighbors here, but he's certainly not one of my favorite picks in the fourth round or anything like that. All right, I'll give my guy here at the running back position, and it's Alvin Kamara, uh, who's the final pick in the fourth round here in consensus ADP. This is back to the ecosystem questions with the Saints. As much as I think Clint Kubiak is going to boost the passing game efficiency up a little bit with some of these more modern concepts, I don't know how that's going to trickle down to the run game. I, I, especially with a questionable at best offensive line, uh, we've got you know a group there with a lot of holes. Obviously, Ryan Ramchek retiring. Uh, we've got, you know, we've we've got uh, Trevor Penning moving back to right tackle. Just so many issues on that offensive line. That's going to affect the run game. Not to mention, like, if the preseason is any indication, they're really leaning into the Taysom Hill experience, which is what it is when you're leaning into the Taysom Hill experience. But if they're <laughs> if they're going to do that, they're going to lean into him at the goal line. 
It, it, yeah, just, that that makes me even more concerned about the Alvin Kamara stuff <laughs> beyond like, hey, if Kendra Miller can build any sort of momentum here, which he probably won't. But uh, I just think there are a lot of ways that the Alvin Kamara fourth round pick can go wrong here. Yeah, the offensive line, we, I, I talked about it. It's not good. Um, even if Derek Carr still peppers him with targets, um, there's just not a lot of upside here. Like, I think we know who Alvin Kamara is. And if there is some kind of evolution or modernization of this offense, I think it's actually going to be moving away from Alvin Kamara. Like, so if there's any kind of opportunity share here to be gained, it's going to be with the wide receivers, not the running back. That's super old. That is getting vultured at the goal line. Um, yeah, I, I just, it's it's hard for me to invest in that old of a running back now that was so dependent on, on, you know, Derek Carr just, Giving him, you know, what he had one. What did he have like 18 receptions in one game? It was some ridiculous. He had that 13 for 33 game uh, against the Bucks, which I think for 33 pathetic, which I think was, I think was his first game (laughs) off of the suspension. Yeah. Like here's the deal. If Alvin Kamara is getting peppered with targets again, this offense is going to suck again. Uh, And I, yeah, I, that means we're definitely, we don't really even want to draft players in this offense anyways, if Alvin Kamara is getting that level of volume. So Mm -hmm. um, I think that's just generally why he's been an avoid for me. I'll go real quick on my round five player that I'm avoiding right now, which is just Kyle Kyle Pitts in the fifth round, bro. Like I'm I'm not out on Kyle (laughs) Pitts this year. I'm generally a Kyle Pitts centrist, but I don't think he should be a fifth round pick, man. Um, I, I think he's more of a sixth rounder. I think he's more of like a seventh rounder. It's just, I, even from a t- he ranks tight end seven uh, in ADP. I have him as the tight end eight. Again, that's that's fine, but it's just the opportunity cost of players going around him. Like there are still some running backs that I'm really interested in drafting. Uh, you know, David Montgomery, like Ramondre Stevenson. I know you're going to hate on Stevenson in a second, but like I. I'm okay. I'd rather have Stevenson than Kyle Pitts in the fifth round. You know, Terry McLaurin is even a player I like. Kyle, Kyler Murray, Joe Burrow at quarterback. Like, I just think that even some of the receivers, man, Rasheed Rice and and uh, Calvin Ridley, I'd rather have in in the fifth round over over a Kyle Pitts. Just I'm in on Pitts bouncing back this year, but having to get into it in the fifth round as opposed to the sixth and seventh, I've just generally been drafting around that. When I do land Kyle Pitts, it's below ADP so far this year. See, now I'm mad I didn't – I must have skipped over Kyle Pitts because I would have given the same answer. Like, that, I just don't understand that. Uh, fifth round – like, he's not proven enough to be a fifth-round grade in any season, in my opinion. And you also have Drake London there. Bijan Robinson is obviously one of the best players in fantasy. There's just too many other options to me that I'm like, uh, I don't know about Kyle Pitts. And yeah, I guess most people would assume like, okay, TJ Hawkinson thrived with, with, um, with Kirk Cousins. So, you know, Kyle Pitts should too, but I think this is another one of those X things where the hype has always been so strong with Kyle Pitts. People just want to see him win. But in reality, if you look at the numbers and the production, it's just not there. So to take him over a lot of the guys that you just mentioned uh, is just egregious, frankly. Um, I don't think there's any person in in round five that I would want more. Like, I don't want than Kyle Pitts. Like, I don't maybe eh, I'm not in love with Amari Cooper, but like still, I would take Amari Cooper over Kyle Pitts. Like, I don't. And this is the thing about drafting the tight end position this year. Like, I one of my thought, I was thinking about putting Travis Kelsey in the bus category mm-hmm. just because of his age and what the Kansas City Chiefs did uh, to, you know, pretty much bolster that wide receiver room. Sam Laporte is going in the second round, too. But after that, I think you can get a lot of good tight ends in that third, fourth territory. But then I would just kind of skip over five through seven because there's just a lot of just like muck and muck, like, they're not really exciting players that I would take over a wide receiver or a running back there. So yeah, I'm just hard. It's I'm hard pressed to spend a fifth rounder on, on a tight end. Like you do it in the early rounds or you do it, you know, probably around six round seven Um, round five should be reserved for the skill positions, you know, running back wide receiver and even quarterback. If you missed out on, you know, that upper echelon. Yeah. I haven't clicked. Uh, we kind of approach the tight end position the same way this year because I haven't clicked much of Kelsey and Laporta in the second, third round turn there, but I've gotten a lot of Trey McBride and Mark Andrews in the fourth round. Uh, you know, cl- right. like you go and look at that fourth round in consensus ADP. It's not, it's not like a great spot. You know, we talked about the guys we yeah. don't really love there. Um, most of the players I like are actually 
you know, either, it's either a quarterback or those tight ends. Uh, you know, like Lamar Jackson goes in this range. Um, you know, sometimes Pat Mahomes will go in this range. Like I'd much rather click on those guys or the, or the two tight ends as opposed to some of those running backs and wide receivers that we that we went through. And then, yeah, I'm with you that. Kincaid, when he falls, I've gotten a little bit of Kincaid, but then I generally don't get into that six, seven, eight range. I've typically come back later and gotten one of the guys that I think mm-hmm. could exceed expectations from an ADP right. standpoint. There is another player in the fifth round that you don't really like, uh, and it's very on brand for what you've talked about so far uh, in terms <laughs> of players to avoid. Yeah, and uh, I think the board, if you're just looking at comparable wide receivers, I'm just not as interested in George Pickens. And it's not because he's not a solid receiver. We saw what he could do with Deontay Johnson off the the field last year. Obviously, he's in Carolina now. He should be the alpha. If you look at the competition in the wide receiver room, not that exciting. Um, But it's really just hinges on the fact that Russell Wilson looks like he's old and washed. And the fact that Justin Fields looks better than him is pretty concerning. And at this point, you know, DJ Moore did look good with Justin Fields, but that is a very unpredictable style of offense when you have to be, you know, playing off, you know, broken plays and a lot of emphasis on the run. I just don't know that that's going to present itself as a position where George Pickens can really thrive. And this offense just looks like it's going to sputter. It doesn't look like they're going to be one of the most prolific offenses. Obviously, Arthur Smith is their offensive coordinator now. So you have a more run-centric offense already. Uh, I love George Pickens. He's a highlight reel. It's kind of like Malik Neighbors, where like he'll make tons of contested catches. He'll do all these highlight reel plays on the sideline. But I just don't know that you're going to get the touchdown equity. And I don't know that you're going to get... Uh, a consistent, reliable option. This guy scored over 20 fantasy points, only four of 17 games last year. Uh, It's going to be hard for me to buy into George Pickens at that price. Yeah, again, this is another player that I've got ranked around where he goes. He's wide receiver 29 in my ranks. He's wide receiver 28 in consensus ADP, but he's not a player that I gravitate gravitate to in this fifth round range. Um, There's just... Generally, other players I like here, I'd rather end up with Tank Dell in the fifth round. I'd rather end up with some of these running backs here. The the, the hardest thing for me to get around is the quarterback situation because I feel like I've gotten a little frustrated with how this quarterback battle has been built up, up to preseason Dan Titus because a lot of people have built this as, oh, wow, what a great fallback plan for the Steelers to have after Kenny Pickett busted. And <laughs> look, it's a cheap it's a cheap plan. They didn't have to spend much to do it. They got Russell Wilson no. on a minimum salary cuz the Broncos are still footing the bill over there. They didn't trade much to get Justin Fields from the Steelers. Nothing. But like there's a reason these two guys were just dumped by their previous teams for to go down <laughs> the rookie route. And we're already doing the the and then I think a lot of the flaws have been shown in preseason at least for Justin Fields, man. Like He's just a guy that's so mistake prone. He's going to put a hard ceiling on your offense. And like Steelers fans are already doing the cope stuff with like, yeah, he way overthrew this, but did the receiver quit on there? It's like, yeah, man, we we just did this for how many years in Chicago? Like we know what Justin Fields is. I think that they could have a much more interesting run game with Fields under center. But from a passing yeah. game standpoint, yeah, I, I get what DJ Moore did with Justin Fields last year. DJ Moore is a much better receiver than George Pickens. Who's And George Pickens much. is... is, is is solid. Like I think he's a he's a good starting X receiver in the league, but he hasn't shown the same quarterback friendly skills, uh, especially like a volatile quarterback like a Fields or even a Russell Wilson at this point. He's not shown those same uh, traits and ability that DJ Moore has, especially from a separation standpoint in the short to intermediate game and being that kind of reliable layup receiver. I I just I, I'm stuck on that part of it. I, the the marriage between like a guy like Fields or Russell Wilson who wants to push it deep outside the numbers that makes sense with George Pickens, but that is also very much leaning into the volatility part of his game. So um, again, fine boom bust wide receiver three, uh, but I don't necessarily see him as a player with a massive ceiling. Where some of these other guys that go in the fifth round, like the Tank Dells, the Zay Flowers, even a T Higgins, man, uh, I can see the massive ceiling with those players. Let's do a couple more rounds here before we get to the mailbag. Uh, let's talk through round six. Um, I, I'll just go with mine here real quick. Zamir White, for all the reasons that we talked about previously, this is an offense that um, I, I don't know that we've got a lot of confidence in. Uh, based on how we broke down the quarterback situation. <laughs> Dan Titus, I, I feel like this is a, a team that I just don't know where we're at. 
Uh, and also, when you look at the preseason usage for Zamir White and Alexander Madison, this is courtesy of Dwayne McFarlane from Fantasy Life. Uh, week one in the preseason, there were three rate, uh, three drives with the first team offense. Um, Zamir White, forty five percent of the snaps. Alexander Madison, Ma- Alexander Madison, thirty eight percent of the snaps. Week two, eight drives. White, thirty five. Madison, thirty three. Uh, like in order for Zamir White to hit as a sixth round pick, and and really not even just meet ADP, but have like t- be able to tell yourself a story that he's going to well exceed ADP. He has to dominate the touches in the Raiders' backfield, and I'm just not sure that we can feel 100% confident that that's what's going to happen. Yeah, I think that you flagged the right point there. It's just like, I, I just don't know what the the committee situation is going to look like. I thought that Zemir White would be the you know certified bell cow back after what he did with Josh Jacobs injured last year, but it looks like you know, there's not that the trust isn't there yet. So um, I I think this is where we're approaching the dead zone for, for running backs. And yeah, we're in Zamir it. White is not on, is not on my list. And the guy that I don't like <laughs> in the same round is Ramondre Stevenson. I feel like he's a very similar where I just don't trust the system and this offense to be prolific. It's going to be one of the worst in the league. Last year, we already saw his yards per carry drop from the year prior. He's only at four yards per carry. Antonio Gibson's there. So if you're talking game script and the Patriots happen to be down in a game, maybe you see more of that work, that receiving work go to Antonio Gibson. I just don't know I can trust in the Patriots offense. So like, if you're choosing dead zone running backs, I would skip over him. I would skip over Zamir White. At this point, you know, maybe you're looking into someone like Najee Harris, who, you know, with Jalen Warren being out for upwards of three weeks with his hamstring injury, you know how those can be lingering issue. Najee Harris is looking pretty good right now. I mean, and even uh, I'll get to somebody else later, but even Raheem Mostert, like I, I probably be more inclined to take him just based off of, you know, what we saw from him, even in a, a shared capacity with Devon Achan. Like, uh, I don't know. I think there's other running backs you could target here that might have a little bit more security. This is the the one I disagree with you on the most. Um, I actually have liked drafting Ramondre Stevenson this year, um, and I kind of have him ranked ahead of most of these dead zone backs uh, as more of a player that's in line with the Josh Jacobs, James Cook group. So I I actually have a a suspicious amount of Ramondre Stevenson this year, which I I don't love uh, because it's the Patriots offense. However, I do think this team is going to be better than expectations because I think the defense is going to be solid. I think they can get some good reps out of some of the young receivers here, like a Jalen Polk. I look, if they come out with, you know, KJ Osborne and and, and the veteran crew in week one, I'm not going to feel that great. But I do think there's some ability here with the young receivers. I think Jacoby Brissett is the perfect bridge quarterback that Ugh. oh come on, man. Don't show, show some respect to Jacoby Brissett. And, and this guy has <laughs> been it, whenever he's been on the field has been an efficient player. We, he, get, he gets into the games with Washington. What last, do you do? He gets into the games uh, with Washington it, last year. It's like we're, we're running a whole different offense than whatever Sam Howell's doing. You know, with the Browns uh, before Deshaun Watson got back on the field, he was top twelve in EPA per dropback. Uh, Same system, we're prop, similar system. We're probably going to see here with Alex Van Pelt as the offensive coordinator. This is a team that I, again I think is going to be better than expectations. <laughs> I think the run game will be the identity force of the offense here, and I, I don't quite know how to calibrate to the Antonio Gibson factor here because he's just been such a weird player in the NFL you know we think of him as a pass catching back because he has a wide receiver background but they didn't always at least in Washington want to use him in passing situations Stevenson has been a guy that's been used in passing situations so they commit to him with a big contract he has been a guy that when we get to the dead zone, if I'm look if I'm looking for a running back too, I don't love some of the receiver picks on the board. I actually ended up with a decent amount of him here. Well, I'll pray for you, bro. <laughs> uh, I just I just don't know that like, the, the Patriots have to decide where they're at. They just traded Matt Judon. Like I like wh- what are they trying to do? This bridge situation is only going to be a bridge for so long before they put in their rookie and Drake May. So like at this point, like I just don't have much faith in where this team is going uh, organizationally to put faith in Ramondre Stevenson as like a clear cut dead zone RB. I mean, at best he's an RB two, but like, I just don't see, I feel like I'd rather have other running backs there, but I, I wish you the best. Thank man. You. Like I, I won't be there, but you know, <laughs> good luck to you. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. Um, I, I, I'll, 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 I might need the support. <laughs> by the middle of the season. All right, let's do one more round before we get to the mailbag here. Let's talk our, our least favorite round seven picks uh, in consensus ADP. I will let you start uh, with Tony Pollard here, a player you are not drafting this year. 
Yeah, it's not that I don't like Tony Pollard. It's just that I prefer Tajay Spears. Okay. And it's really, mm-hmm. if you look at a lot of his PFF data and advanced metrics, like Tajay Spears was a really good running back in the opportunities that he seized last year. Um, so in terms of round, they're going around late. Uh, Tajay Spears is going around later. I'll just prefer to have him over Tony Pollard. I think that's totally fair. And I, I look at some of these other running backs going in round seven. Raheem Mostert, Najee Harris, uh, Jalen Warren, although he's is dealing with a hamstring injury right now. You know, even DeAndre Swift, I, I think I might. Oh, I would. Yeah, I'd he's okay he's kind of close Swift with Pollard to me, and I, I haven't really been in on DeAndre Swift much, but um, he, that that's maybe the one I'm going back and forth on. But the, all those other guys I'd much rather have than Tony Pollard. Uh, and, and I think if you want to have Tajay Spears straight up, I'm doing kind of the hedge ranking with the Titans backs where I have them very, very close uh, in right. ADP. <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll mention Keenan Allen here. He's actually the first pick in the seventh round. Second straight year, I'm going to hate on Keenan Allen. Uh, I'm sure I mentioned him last year, and it did not go well uh, for me. <laughs> However, um, th- I think I think I was a year too early on the Keenan Allen decline. Also, by the way, you know, it's been funny seeing some of the, the – the, there's all the reports about his weight and all that stuff and everything yeah, out of camp. That, a little chubby. But then, we, you know, you're seeing some of the clips in the preseason and, and kind of watching the film there. It doesn't look great for Keenan Allen. And it's like he, he kind of looked like that last year with the Chargers. He just was funneled a ton of targets because there really was nobody else. And, like, this is where I get I get hung up on, the, on stats and receivers and stuff like that. Like, yeah, Keenan Allen was super productive. He was – you know, super efficient on like a per route basis, but the offense wasn't good. Like the the offense in LA was well below expectations. And I don't think that's Keenan Allen's fault necessarily, but I just think that if you're going to funnel your offense through that player, you also have to have other verifiable threats. And the bears have so many other verifiable threats here on offense. And yeah. <laughs> like I've had Roma Dunze ranked ahead of Keenan Allen straight up all off season. All offseason, I've had Roma Dunze ranked ahead of Keenan Allen, and I feel like by week four, that will be obvious. I feel like Roma Dunze ahead of Keenan Allen, it will just be straight up obvious because, number one, like you think about how Caleb Williams wants to play. You you see how he's playing in the preseason. He's going off script. He's he's looking to push the ball mm-hmm. downfield. That's not Keenan Allen's mm-hmm. game. I think Keenan Allen will be a nice security blanket for Caleb Williams, but... Every you know, I come back to the report that Jory Epstein had on this podcast where she said that when Caleb goes off script, Rome is the guy he's looking for. DJ Moore is going to have a big role in this team. I still like drafting DJ Moore, but yeah, Roma Dunze uh, ahead of Keenan Allen has been a take of mine all off season and the last couple weeks of you know reports from camps and preseason stuff like that. It has not done anything to change my mind. I f- I, I see Aaron Rodgers when I see uh, Caleb Williams go off script and. He found him in the back of the end zone in the, pre- in the preseason game. Like I, I think that that's just a, a rapport that's going to only begin to blossom. Um, I'm just, it's it's interesting because like when you look at the Texans, I'm like, oh, which one of the three do I want to choose? Um, I still prefer Stephon Diggs well over Keenan Allen. So Same. like at this point, like I, I think that this is going to be an offense that's going to be kind of the targets are going to be kind of spread out. But I think Keenan Allen, just given the age and how that offense is really going to be the most the best at its most success is really going to be when Caleb's, you know, on the run rollouts. Whereas, you know, I think Keenan Allen's really thrived with a traditional quarterback and, and, and Justin Herbert and the route running expertise and all that. But I, yeah, I think Roma Dunze is eventually going to, going to upseat him and it, who knows it could be off the rip. Um, but yeah, I'm not really drafting much of Keenan Allen. All right, let's take a final break here. When we come back, we're going to dive into a couple pressing questions in the fantasy mailbag. All right, welcome back. We know everybody listening to this show, Dan, they're in their most important drafts. Like that, that's coming up, okay? Probably in the next 10 days, something like that, your most important draft is going to be happening. And we care about you, the people, our people, the listeners of this show. So we're here to help. And that's why let's welcome in the fantasy mailbag. You've got mail. When it comes, I want to win. Goodbye. Let's get into Bill, who sent in this voice memo about his two-quarterback league. I'm in a 10-team, non-PPR, two-quarterback league, and I'm drafting 10th this year. Do I take a top-five quarterback and the best running back wide receiver available with my first two picks, or do I pass on quarterbacks altogether and take the best running back wide receiver available and hope to get a good quarterback in the third and fourth rounds. Thank you. 
All right, Dan, two quarterback league strategy. Um, open your brain. Tell me how you usually uh, approach these situations. Uh, well, in a recent mock draft, you'd probably look at me crazy because I took B. John Robinson <laughs> won in a super flex league. Wow. Uh, but in this situation, I would take a top five quarterback in the first two rounds in a super flex uh, where you have the option of a two quarterback league and then take the best wide receiver and running back available rather than wait. Um, because I do think quarterbacks are going to fly off the board and you want to make sure that you can secure one of Josh Allen, Jalen Hurts, Lamar Jackson, et cetera. Um, Patrick Mahomes, sorry, I can't admit the best quarterback in football. Yeah, good idea. Um, but yeah, I think uh, top five, then going to RB wide receiver is the best strategy there. Yeah, so I do think quarterback, there's a cliff after six uh, this year. Uh, to me, the, the first tier of quarterbacks is Josh Allen, Jalen Hurts, and Patrick Mahomes. Um, I'd ideally like to have one of those guys, but it depends on where you pick. That's the thing with any of these type of questions sure. is it does depend on where you pick. Um, if you're in that back half of the first round, I don't think you're going to have a top six quarterback to, to pick from here. Uh, I don't think you're going to get a true. chance at then tier two, which is Lamar, CJ Stroud, and Anthony Richardson. Uh, so you could be looking at a situation, and, and I've been in this spot before. I'm in a draft right now where it's a super flex league, and uh, in the top of the second round, I took Jordan Love. I, I like definitely don't, in a vacuum, like Jordan Love ahead of some of these running backs and wide receivers. But me personally, I don't want to leave the first two rounds of a super flex or two quarterback draft and not have, especially two quarterback, right? Because you've got to start a quarterback in that second spot. I don't want to not have, at least to me, a top eight quarterback there. Jordan Love is my QB eight. Kyler Murray is my QB seven. I'd like to have one of those guys in place. And then, man, it really depends on the, the, you come back in, the, in that third round range and get another guy. It's going to be tough. I almost always hate you know, taking that second quarterback uh, there. I think in this draft, I took Matthew Stafford, uh, the points per first down league that um, I'm in with John Paulson from 4 for 4, organized this. Uh, a lot of Andy Barons uh, and, and many other respectable people. Many respectable people and Andy are also in this league. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think I ended up taking Matthew Stafford in the fourth round, which does feel aggressive. I don't think Stafford has like a top five quarterback ceiling, but – Generally, I've I've wanted to come away from the first four rounds with at least a couple quarterbacks in any format where you can start two guys. Yeah, I think in the the mock draft that we did where I took Bijan number one, I believe I went Bijan and then I went two quarterback right after that. So I think I ended up with like Kyler and and like Matthew Stafford. Um, so I was actually okay with that given how many teams that were in it. But you have to be willing to sacrifice. You know, if you don't get those top at least one of the top six seven quarterbacks like it's going to be pretty rough for you you don't want to be out there starting you know Dak Prescott and Kirk Cousins right. it's going to be a rough it's going to be a rough one for you yeah because then you better hit on those running back and receiver picks uh like right. and if right, you right. do you can you can take down a super flex league can, with Dak and, and sure. Kirk if Kirk obviously is is fine and and kind of just his usual self you can you could probably hit a hit a pretty big ceiling there but you have to nail those running back and wide receiver picks if you right. don't then you know everything's going to fall apart anyways and hey better luck next season uh, i will say one <laughs> one last year. note on this too <laughs> if i do end up with the stafford geno smith type as my qb2 i would like to come back and get a third quarterback um yes, you know hopefully no one in this draft that i'm talking about is listening to this because i've definitely thought in the last couple of rounds <laughs> hey do i want to grab a will levis do i want to grab a bryce young you know a guy that certainly is not a guarantee but has some path to maybe being a high-end qb2 if a few things break right just because there's some youth and the upside of the unknown all right let's get another one in here from dom from australia sends in this voice memo about a couple of players we just talked about today, Dan Titus. So talk about some synergy here. G'day, Matt Harmon. Dom here from Australia. Look, all summer long, you've told me not to draft Alvin Kamara. And now I've got him and he's my best flex for a guillotine league. Week one, he's got the Panthers. It's looking pretty good. Uh, my other options are Malik Neighbors or Aaron Jones. What do you reckon? Love to hear thoughts. Cheers, mate. All right, Dan. So for the uninitiated here, a guillotine league is where the lowest scoring person on every week uh, gets eliminated. Uh, so yeah, pretty big, you know, pretty big stakes here, buddy. Uh, in terms of Dom's question, we don't like Alvin Kamara. We mentioned him. You don't like Malik Neighbors. Mentioned him. Aaron Jones is also in line for Week One. I know Week One questions here 
in, in, on August 20th. It seems like 100 years away. It feels 100 years away, and yet it's right around the corner. Uh, as Dom mentions, Alvin Kamara does play the Saints in week one. He is probably the safest option here. And like when you're going guillotine, you, you probably want to trend a little safe here. Um, Malik Neighbors, you've mentioned your concerns there. Daniel Jones facing Brian Flores. Flores' defense in week one, I could see that being a little bit messy. Uh, just because Flores likes to throw the book at you from a blitz perspective, from a coverage perspective. They did a lot of creative things in Minnesota last year. Uh, and Aaron Jones against the Giants uh, on the road. Sam Darnold is the starting quarterback. Does Alvin Kamara sound like the best option of these three guys who all have at least a couple things wrong in their profile this year? Uh, so if it's survive and advance, then I think it's got to be Aaron Jones. Oh, I, I don't want okay. Alvin Kamara for reasons we've already discussed. The offensive line, the offensive scheme switch, the mileage, just not really interested in Alvin Kamara. Neighbors, I just don't trust Daniel Jones at all. He's not good. So <laughs> that leaves, by process of elimination, Aaron Jones, who is coming off of a not the best year, but I think that the situation that's presented itself with Kevin O'Connell, Sam Darnold's there locked in at starting quarterback. Um, I'm actually kind of high on, on Aaron Jones. I wouldn't be mad, mad at taking him. I love the first the first week matchup against the Giants, that's a cakewalk. And then, hey, then he has to go uh, in a tough matchup against the 49ers, which, you know, game script dependent, he could get a lot of uh, check downs there. So, um, yeah, I think you're, you got to start off with Aaron Jones there. Here's, if you want to go with Aaron Jones, um, the thing you could tell yourself is he's probably the healthiest he's going to be all year right now. Uh, you know, that's a fact. Knock on wood, obviously, because <laughs> we're recording this on August 20th. Anything could happen. Um, but as long as he's got a clean bill the rest of the offseason, uh, he's, he's like I said, literally the healthiest he will probably be all year. Eventually, he, he's a guy that you just have to assume, based on recent, recent history, is going to miss some time. That's definitely in the range of outcomes. But right now, you get a guy that did look really, really good down the stretch last year for the Green Bay Packers. Uh, and, and they should be trying to play a little conservative on offense this year. They, they typically push the bill in terms of pass attempts and pass volume there un under Kevin O'Connell in Minnesota. Uh, however, given the, you know, complexion of this offense with Sam Darnold and everything, I think they will be a little more run heavy uh, this year than maybe they have in previous seasons. And that can certainly start off in week one, man. I, I just don't know about like brother Dom guillotine league week one. <laughs> you're already putting your, you're already like asking to start off your fantasy season cursing Taysom Hill it just feels so early it feels so early in the fantasy season to have Taysom Hill uh screwing with your mentals okay it just, that, we got we got a long long way to go okay don't do it to yourself bro don't, don't do, do it to it yourself, yourself. <laughs> so all right that's all we've got from the mailbag today we have a ton more to get to uh whether it's email with some of the Twitter responses. We'll make sure to sprinkle those in throughout the course of the week. And we'll try to hit at least a couple of these every single episode. Dan, appreciate you doing this uh, in the inaugural edition of the Fantasy Mailbag. Again, reminder, folks, we're open for business the rest of August, so be sure to send your questions in to fantasymailbag at yahoosports.com. Uh, if we don't get to your question right away, we're going to get to it. Trust me. Like I said, promises made, promises kept. We are going to get to these mailbag questions one way or another. But for now, that is going to do it for us today. Dan Titus, appreciate you doing this one. Um, I will try yes, to have you on at some point to not just be a hater. That is my promise to you. <laughs> I don't know. I'm kind of liking the hater that we got going on here. But yeah, I'll, I'll accept whatever invitation you got, brother. <laughs> well, I, I, I'll give you something else, but go ahead and put this on your calendar a year from today. <laughs> You will be back on for uh, the busts episode, the busts, whatever guys you're drafting around. We're going to have you back on for that one because, like I said, you are now officially Yahoo Fantasy's resident hater. Like I said, that is going to do it for us today. Appreciate everybody uh, for listening. Appreciate everybody uh, who's shown me some support and personal life perspective the last couple of weeks, taking some time away from the pod. I, you know, there may be more episodes I'm going to miss. There may be more content I'm going to miss. Uh, that just is what it is right now. I, I post about the situation on Twitter if you want to check that out. Uh, again, appreciate all the support I've gotten both internally and from the listeners. So, uh, yeah, we'll just keep pounding away at this thing, man. It's preseason. A lot of stuff is going on. Conviction Weeks on the podcast continues to roll. Tomorrow with Andy Barons and Tara Roberts, we're going to be doing an in-person episode for breakouts for 2024 here in the Yahoo studio in LA. Until then, we're out. <laughs>